as you. Okay, so the starting point. This is this is the beginning, and and most people know this now, but it's amazing how in in in, in centuries of science and uh, centuries of being human beings, um, this hasn't been self-evident and. Interestingly, and when you think about yourself at work, and in fact, when I did that acknowledgement of country, you would have become aware of it. Then you're like, oh yeah, there's a there's a man in the screen in, in the box, and he's and he's talking about uh, yeah the traditional custodians of the land. Yeah, yeah, got it. And then when I start talking about feeling into country, you're like, oh yeah, oh, there's another layer there. And actually, my I, I can feel that in my body. So it's not always obvious and particularly when we when we're working we're working at a very cognitive level when we uh, are engaging with our colleagues at work uh, even when we're engaging um with our, with our friends and family a lot of the time we're engaging at a very very cognitive level and uh we we can forget uh, uh no it's okay david we can't hear you so the only person that anyone can hear is me uh there's no need to press a mute button uh, in in uh, in demio so your brain and your body are connected, connected, and I want you to get a sense of that. Um, you know, there, there's a definition, a lovely definition of mind that's come out of uh, cognitive neuroscience that says, um, you know, mind is the uh, is the uh, is the uh, you know organisation and, um, and and uh, processing uh, of the flow of energy and information, uh, and that is done throughout the body. And this image shows, you know, that your heart and your gut, in particular. Um, have a great deal of neurons, not as many as the brain, uh, but uh, still there's a lot of a lot going on in your mind through your heart, through your gut, through your skin, through the rest of the body. All right, so here's a bit of a question for you. Uh, throw out an answer. This, it, it does, it's, it's, um, it's not, you know, don't worry about getting the right answer, but think about your brain. What do you think the purpose of it is? Uh, you know, if, you, if I was to ask you, hey, what's your brain for? Uh, what would you say? I'll, I'll give you a moment. Just, just chuck it out there. You know, I've got a few. I've got a few suggestions on the left hand side. Uh, what do you think? Keep your body going. Yeah, good one, Lauren. Uh, solve problems. Dave controls your body. Survival. Question things. Yeah, rationalizing things drives the nervous system. Yeah, thanks, guys. It, it's sort of the go. Well, what does my brain do? It thinks. Uh, other people say, oh, it's all you know. Human beings are all about connection tammy's overthinks everything um it's about um you know it's about connection and relating to other people um it's about solving problems you know human beings are uh, a great um are great at solving problems um you know is it are we just creative beings do we create great art what's what's our what's our brain for and some of you have sort of cottoned onto it um and it's it starts with this little little critter here. Um, these are things called uh, sea squirts. Uh, I've, I've forgotten the Latin name, um, but they are literally um, little um, organisms that uh, attach to coral and they squirt seawater, hence sea squirts. And you'll see them sort of pumping back and forth when they're under the water. And they all like to sort of collect together. Uh, and they do reproduce, they do reproduce uh, like uh, that which makes them an animal they do reproduce and when they're born they have a brain and when they're born they're born free and uh and they they mostly drift in the ocean currents but they also wiggle their little bodies and until they find a nice bit of coral to connect to and then they latch onto that bit of coral and to help them to really latch onto the bit of coral they die the first thing they do is they digest their brain creepy huh they digest their brain because and this is this is sort of you know the inference uh from the research is that they digest their brain because they don't need it anymore because once they've attached to the rock there's no need for movement all they're doing is swaying with the ocean currents they've got a very kind of rhythmic pulsing sensation that allows seawater to pass through them uh, that they collect nutrients from so the other the other great example that's used in the literature um, for the purpose of the brain is our little local koala, because we have fossil records of uh, you know, ancient koalas uh, from you know, millions of years ago, and they were they were bigger, and it was pretty clear that they were at that time evolved to moving around on the ground, and to a great extent they were foragers. Uh, and it's you know it's quite possible that with the with the arrival of the dingo and the dog uh, it wasn't safe in Australia on the ground anymore, and so they started to live permanently in the trees. 
once they started living permanently in the trees and they started to um, eat uh, primarily eat certain kinds of, of gum leaves um, they became much more sedentary they stayed still for most of their lives and their brains shrunk considerably as evidenced by skull size and so the insight is that the purpose of the drive of the brain is to control complex movement so this connection between brain and body is far more significant than than we've perhaps ever realized when talking about the connection between the brain and the body uh, we always go to this really fundamental uh, fight flight freeze response which which pretty much everybody has heard of uh, because it's uh, right up there at the top of um, you know general knowledge about pop psychology but it is a fundamental concept in psychology uh, the, the the sort of the the more technical name is the is the polyvagal system uh, and it's important because um, there's a nerve that runs from from the base of the spine uh, I'm sort of pointing to the base of my spine I'm trying to turn my head base of the spine down in down through the spinal cord into the body and that's known as the polyvagal nerve and the polyvagal system is that is that brainstem with the nerve coming down into the bottle body so fight and flight uh, refers a uh, fight flight refers to one half of the occasion equation which is called hyper arousal and freeze refers to the other half of the equation which is hypo arousal and these are the two primary responses of an organism to any organism to keep itself safe uh, one way that um, you can think about the brain is that you know you can think about it in terms of the first stage of, of um, you know multi multipedal animal evolution which was the reptile uh, dinosaurs lizards uh, etc and they've got really basic brains and essentially our body our, our, our skeletal system matches their skeletal systems if you go to, to a museum and you look at ancient uh, ancient fish uh, ancient um, uh, dinosaurs and you look at their skeletons you go god that's remarkably like a human skeleton it's not that far away even though it was millions and millions of years ago and they seem like remarkably different creatures but we share and we share that part of the brain with them essentially all they had was that bottom part of our brain plus that polyvagal system and what it does is that when it sees something that it wants to eat it goes for it when it sees something that's about to attack it it runs away from it or, or it fights with it uh, that's hyper arousal uh, it's about fighting it's about anger aggression frustration rage when we translate it into human emotions or it's about flight which when we translate into human emotions is about nervousness anxiety panic and about finding somewhere to hide the other thing that uh, mammals in particular learn to do but also you'll see this in reptiles and birds is that if they perceive a threat and it's a bit further away or if they perceive that there's no hiding place or there's no hope of winning a fight they'll just freeze literally just go stock still and you'll, you'll see birds do this you'll see small prey mammals in particular do this you'll even but you'll even see large cats and other animals when something that is something when something happens the first thing they do is just go very very still and wait and see what happens as human beings um, we tend to get stuck in that hypo arousal freeze state and we tend to call it things like depression we experience a dullness a numbness we can dissociate from our bodies we can have a sense of actually not being in our bodies particularly if this hypo arousal continues for too long and we can we can experience a sense of disconnection both from ourselves and from the world around us in uh, polyvagal theory and in uh, modern day responses to trauma in particular um, they use this model and they call it the window of tolerance model and it's about being able to keep ourselves in out of hyper arousal and out of hypo, hypo arousal and to keep ourselves in this zone in this mid zone which they call the window of tolerance um, we don't want to go into panic and anxiety and anger and agitation we don't go and want to go into numbness and shut down and uh, poor self-care poor boundaries we want to stay in this zone where we're a bit activated because it's motivating uh, but we're not overwhelmed uh, by those feelings and certainly if we do become overwhelmed we're able to come out of it and come back into that optimal uh, state of arousal okay so how does physical activity connect back to those um, neurological and psychological concepts um, this is a good good starting point because essentially what 
what this webinar is going to become about is it's going to become about a motivational uh, talk for, for getting people, uh, for getting you guys off, off, off your seats, uh, out from behind your screens, out of your locked down houses perhaps, and moving your bodies. Uh, in Time magazine, uh, a psychiatrist, a lead psychiatrist uh, was, was quoted as saying, if there were a drug that could do for human health everything that exercise can, it would likely be the most valuable pharmaceutical ever developed. Uh, it could be that the COVID vaccine has uh, superseded that that statement, but uh, it's certainly you know it's certainly an interesting idea that that acts that exercise is the most powerful drug we have, and and it is it's still the number one treatment for for depression, number one treatment for anxiety, number one treatment for lethargy. Um, if you if you want to change um, the way that you feel about your life, start moving your body. All right. So what are the physiological uh, impacts on your body. Some of those are pretty obvious, but it's worth just ticking through them. What does, it, what does, what does physical activity do? It increases your blood flow. Uh, it replenishes oxygen and distributes oxygen throughout your body. It replenishes nutrients and distributes nutrients throughout your body. It uh, And it facilitates waste and toxin removal and discharge through your body, including through sweating. Sweating is a great way of getting rid of stuff that our body doesn't like. And in fact, there's some things that our body gets rid of um, that, that they, they can't be get or get rid of got, can't be gotten rid of through um, through urinate, urinating or defecating. Um, it's it's the it's the only way to sort of process those toxins. So the addition the the next point is that movement of an increased blood flow increases your health, it increases your strength, and it increases the effectiveness of all of your major organs. Which major organs? Your skin, your muscles, your heart, your lungs, your stomach, your kidneys, your pancreas, your liver, your intestines, your bowels, your bladder, everything works better in a body that's exercising. Everything works better in a body that's exercising. So if you're not feeling good and you've been quite sedentary, you haven't been exercising, you, you know, you can't be bothered, you know, you've been feeling down, you've been feeling deflated, um, you know, everything starts to work less efficiently. I got injured a few weeks ago. I used to be, you know, I'm, I'm a very active person. Uh, the only kind of thing I could do to take care of myself was literally to to stop exercising and I'm just starting to feel it. Um, I'm starting to feel lethargic as I'm talking. I can feel a little tickle in my throat uh, and I'm just not feeling as though um, everything's functioning as well as I would as well as I would like it to. And I'm really kind of, um, I'm actually on sitting on a fence. Part of me is like, oh, it's quite nice just to sit around and I've got more time and, you know, it takes a bit of effort to go to go and exercise and quite like just being a, uh, being a sedentary kind of being. But my body's going, yeah, but you don't feel good. And so this other part of me is like busting to, to get out and do some more exercise. All right, more benefits. You, and and this, is, this is from long-term um, studies. It reduces cardiovascular disease. It reduces heart disease, lung disease, uh, blood diseases. Um, it reduces um, risks of bladder, breast, colon, endometrial, esophageal, kidney, stomach, and lung cancers. Um, it's, it regulates hormones, including estrogen. It lowers levels of insulin and reduces the incidences of a diabetes. It reduces inflammation in the body. It improves your immune system functioning. So when you're exercising, you're actually more, um, you're more, um, you know, your, your immune system stronger and you're more resistant to different diseases and viruses. Uh, your obesity, of course, goes down. It improves your gastrointestinal functioning. You're like everything, your, your stomach, your bowels, your intestines all work better. Your bones are healthier and you sleep better. I can't tell you the number of people I've been work, I've been talking to over the last year and a half who have really struggled with sleep. That uh, as their routines have been thrown out, as they've exercised left, uh, exercised less, uh, they've they've stopped. They've, they've, they've really struggled with sleep, and then they feel tired all the time, and it creates this this self fulfilling cycle. Start exercising, suddenly sleep comes so much more easily. What about the known mental health benefits? So we know that exercise literally changes the brain. So, and, and, it, and it increases the kinds of chemicals that will grow the brain and it increases the, the extent of those chemicals by over 30%. So people who exercise regularly end up having bigger brains. For some time in, in, in neuroscience, it was believed that um, all brains would always shrink. That you remember, you remember this idea that you, you've had a certain number of brain cells, and then slowly, uh, after about the age of 25 to 26, it slow your brain slowly decreased in size, and you couldn't grow anymore. No, exercise will grow your brain, gives you a positive mood. Most people go, "Oh my gosh, exercise itself 
painful, don't like it, but gee whiz, do I feel good afterwards. Uh, it gives you improved cognitive functioning and improves your memory uh, in, uh, I think it was South Korea, um, you know, it was exercise became mandatory in, in primary school because they wanted to increase the intelligence of the population. And you know what, they probably haven't done a bad job. It enhances your problem solving abilities. It increases your feelings of self-esteem and self-efficacy. When you get out there and exercise, you feel like you can do. It improves your spatial awareness. When you move your body, it gives you a better sense of where your body is in space. Uh, it increases your energy levels. You feel more alive, you feel more awake, you feel more motivated, you feel more energetic. And it also improves your emotional regulation. Uh, and, and it's almost as simple as that willingness to put your body into a state of physical discomfort through physical exercise and to tolerate that, essentially to say to yourself, I'm doing this for a reason. Yeah, this is good for me. I like doing this. I'm going to feel good later is essential for finding that window of tolerance. Because for us human beings, what happens is we get outside of our window of tolerance and then we react to our own anxiety, we react to our own anger. And so we kind of keep ourselves out of our, out of our window of tolerance. When we exercise, we get better at tolerating discomfort and so better at bringing ourselves back into that window of tolerance. So more long-term benefits of, uh, of, of physical activity on mental health, it reduces depression, anxiety, nervous tension, as I said, number one treatments for, for depression and anxiety, uh, nervousness, stress in your body, go exercise. Uh, positive mood, energy level, self-efficacy, self self-esteem, cognitive function, short-term, long-term memory, it increases your brain size, uh, it's, it demonstrably increases neuroplasticity and neurogenesis, improves your overall brain health, and it also exercises and dementia away. So if you don't want to start to fall apart mentally when you get older, or if you are getting older and you're trying to keep things like Alzheimer's and dementia away, physical activity should be at the top of your list. Often we go looking for uh, pharmacology nowadays. We go to the doctor and say, hey doctor, I'm feeling like this or I'm feeling like that, or I don't, I'm scared of this, or I'm scared of that, can you give me something for it? When actually the best treatment for most of these things is actually to get out there and do physical exercise. So what kind of exercise? how much exercise and and the short answer is that that depends on on what you are doing already and so you always need to um, start slowly and, and build up and that's where patience really comes into it i'm aware of that at the moment i've been off for a few weeks and i i know and i've, I've just had these <laughs> had these conversations with, with some of my more medically minded friends of going oh yeah i want to i gotta get back on the bike and i want to jump back in in the pool and swim and want to you know want to go surfing and want to do all these things and they're like yeah just take it easy and I'm like, i have to remind myself if i don't take it easy i'll just be back where i started i'll be injured again i can't i can't go and do what i was doing before i took time off i need to start at a very low level and build up the the science this is the science says that this is kind of the the optimum yeah uh, and and you can do more than this you know at least this much or more so cardiovascular exercise and we're going to break it up between cardiovascular and strength and resistance training because they have different benefits so the cardiovascular exercise should be about 30 to 60 minutes a day um remember back in the, the back back in the 70s and early 80s we had life be in it you know 30 minutes a day that's actually really good advice. Uh, so it should be 30, 60 minutes, three to four times per week. Um, brisk walking is enough. So if you're just like, okay, get up in the morning, go for a walk around the block, 30 minutes, go through the, go for a walk along the park, uh, through the park, go for a walk along the creek or the river, go for a walk along the beach, wherever you are. Um, you can go up a mountain. That's great. Um, Cause that, you know, I used to walk up a hill and geez, I'll be sweating at the top. So that's enough. A light stroll is nice, but it's not really enough um, to get the benefits that, that you might want for your mental health. Uh, running, swimming, cycling, aerobics, dancing, um, any, any, anything that, that gets your heart pumping. And you know, a good indication is if you're sweating, then you're probably doing enough. Different is strength and resistance training. Uh, and you only need to do this a couple of times a week for 30 minutes, and it has different positive benefits. In particular, 
to what we call interoception or body awareness. That's where you become more aware of the sensations um, in your heart, in your gut, in your muscles, and even in your bones. So there's feelings, you know, that, that sensations available to you all throughout your body. When, and this is what mindfulness and meditation does. Meditation and mindfulness will say, okay, we'll sit still and go into these different parts of your body. But when you do weights, when you do yoga, when you do Pilates, calisthenics, gymnastics, when you do activities like rock climbing, it brings that same body awareness, which also starts to increase your emotional awareness and your ability to have self-control. So when you're actively using your brain to control your body, particularly so, slow, strong, uh, very, very detailed movements, then that also increases your ability to control your emotions in different settings like social situations. Just keeping an eye on the time. Oh, we're getting we're getting there. So we're nearly we're nearly there. Um, other things you can do: slow yoga, mindfulness based, um, uh, and meditations. Um, same thing gives you that body awareness, gives you the ability to tolerate stress without shifting into hyper hypo arousal. Um, there's different breathing exercises, box breathing. Um, I've got I've got there four seven eight um, breathing, seven eleven me breathing. Uh, the one that's in the uprise app is is uh, three by three by three by three box breathing, which is kind of breathe in for three, hold for three, breathe out for three, hold for three, breathe in for three. And what that does, and I can already feel it calming my nervous system that's racing to, to get the information across before we have to end this webinar today. And again, that brings awareness to your body and it soothes your what's called that your autonomic nervous system. It soothes that polyvagal system. Um, the other one that's really interesting that I've been trying uh, over the last uh, couple of years is cold showers. Really surprised me how useful this is. Um, and and what, I, what seems to be useful, um, and there's a guy called Google a crazy looking wild and then he, he climbs he climbs Kilimanjaro in his uh, in his um, in his boots and his shorts and nothing else uh, and takes groups up and, and he exposes people to extreme extreme cold uh, and they they report it you know really amazing physical benefits but also psychological benefits. Uh, Wim Hof says that intentional discomfort is the ultimate cure, and so when you are having a hot shower and then you flick it suddenly to the cold shower, your body will be shocked. And essentially, it will be shocked and it will go into that fight flight response. And if you can self talk yourself and say to yourself, stay with it, stay with it, stay with it, because you know what you want to do? You want to scream, you want to jump, you want to run. And if you say to yourself, don't do that, just stay in the cold shower, it's not going to hurt you, it's going to be okay. And you do that and you build, you, you know, 10 seconds is a start, then 30 seconds, then a minute, and eventually you'll be able to do two or three minutes and it won't, you'll just be like having a shower. Some people just say, skip the hot shower altogether, end up going for the cold shower. But it really teaches your body to not react, which is so much uh, of what occurs in, in mental health. You know, mental health is so much about us reacting to, 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 to imagined threats. It's about our body reacting and then our brain reacting to our body. Have a cold shower, your body reacts, your brain reacts. You say to yourself, you don't need to react. You don't need to react. You can just stand here. That's fine. And then that teaches your brain and your body how to do the same thing in response to difficult emotions. Okay. So again, beginning to exercise, um, just take it slowly. You have to build up. Uh, take it easy. That's that slide says the same thing. Uh, we need to finish, so we'll we'll leave it there. There's the key takeaways.